It's a hard pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, Provost uh, Graduate Student uh, Lecture Series. Uh, today's speaker is Ann Wallace, who actually graduated in December from the, uh, the Department of Anthropology, where he's sticking around to do a postdoc. Ian came to us from the University of Minnesota. Um, as a biologist, a neurobiologist, I'm used to doing experiments all the time. My, my understanding of anthropology is that it's not always so easy to actually do experiments, and so I'm really looking forward to today's talk to hear how one can go from people to mice and back and forth. Yes. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so biophysical signals have existed since the beginning of life on this planet and uh, not surprisingly the ability of biologic systems to sense and respond to physical stimuli is a common attribute of essentially all life forms. Uh, one well-known example of this sort of phenotypic plasticity is the um, capacity of the skeleton to sense and respond to changes in its mechanical environment by adjusting its structure and strength according to functional demands. This process, often referred to as bone functional adaptation or Wolf's Law, has long fascinated me and it's been the subject of much of my research over the past few years and I'm really uh, honored to be able to share some of this uh, uh, research with you today, so thank you for being here. Now, the process by which the skeleton responds to mechanical signals is complex, uh, but it fundamentally involves coordinated site-specific activation of the cells responsible for bone formation and resorption, osteoblast and osteoclast respectively, which orchestrate focal modeling and remodeling of the bone tissue. So typically, physical activities that involve skeletal loading, such as running or jumping, tend to shift the balance in bone turnover toward net formation, which can lead to bigger, stronger bones, Whereas decreased loading, like that associated with a couch potato lifestyle, typically leads to net resorption and ultimately to more slender, fragile bones. A classic example of the anabolic potential of, of bone loading is the asymmetry in upper limb bone size that's often observed in professional tennis players. For example, here's a radiograph from a classic paper by Jones and colleagues comparing the humeri of a professional tennis player who had 20% more cortical bone in his dominant arm, which was responsible for repeatedly hitting the ball, relative to his non-dominant arm, which typically just tossed the ball into the air. And a classic example of the catabolic potential of skeletal unloading or disuse is the bone loss that's often observed in astronauts enduring microgravity conditions for long stretches of time. Now, a lot of research by clinicians and biomedical engineers has been devoted to understanding bone's responsiveness to loading, since harnessing the sensitivity of the skeleton to mechanical signals might provide opportunities for promoting bone health and treating uh, injuries and diseases like osteoporosis. In fact, as some of you may know, we have uh, some of the world's leading experts on this subject right here at Stony Brook in the biomedical engineering department. However, there's another group of scientists who've also long been uh, interested in the relationship between bone morphology and loading, and those are biological anthropologists who study the skeletal remains of our ancestors. Among many anthropologists, and indeed more broadly among vertebrate paleontologists who study uh, skeletal remains, there's a general acceptance that since bones are shaped at least to some extent by physical activity, then it might be possible to infer the lifestyles of ancient populations by measuring their bone structure. So within this uh, paradigm, populations characterized by thick, strong bones would be interpreted as having been highly active, whereas populations with thin, gracile bones would be interpreted as having been more sedentary. So a typical anthropological study might go something like this. Bone structure in a modern population whose physical activity patterns are more or less known is measured as a baseline. For example, here's femoral mid-shaft cortical bone area in a sample of modern New Yorkers, along with a picture of a particularly famous New Yorker, uh, plotted against femoral length cubed, which is a commonly used uh, proxy for body size. So an easier way of thinking about this is simply bone quantity versus body size. Then bone structure is measured in a past population with unknown physical activity patterns, for example, upper Paleolithic humans living in Europe during the late Pleistocene. And their activity patterns are inferred based on their structural similarity to the modern reference sample. 
So based on this plot, one would infer that Upper Paleolithic early modern humans were on average more physically active than modern New Yorkers since they have more bone quantity uh, relative to their body size. That is, we're comparing the height of the slopes here, so the y-intercept. Then another past population might be added to the mix, for example, Middle Paleolithic Neanderthals, uh, whose physical activity patterns can then be inferred relative to the modern reference, as well as the other past population. So in this case, one would infer that Neanderthals were not only more physically active than modern New Yorkers, but they were also more physically active than Upper Paleolithic humans. And this last observation might lead to speculations about adaptive differences between the two past populations. Now I should stress that reconstructions of past physical activity based on skeletal remains are extremely common in the anthropological literature. Uh, I'm aware of at least 100 such publications published in the last couple decades, and that might be a pretty major underestimate. Okay, so at this point I want to briefly digress and explain how I got interested in the effects of physical activity on bone structure. I, uh, I've been fascinated with prehistory since I was very young, but my interest in human evolution really began to flourish during my undergraduate years and my early graduate years when I was afforded several opportunities to travel around the world and excavate a number of famous sites in some of the most exciting regions in paleoanthropology. And several times I felt the thrill of discovering remarkable fossils and beautiful artifacts. And I learned very well uh, the common wisdom about what these fossils and artifacts tell us about the lifestyles of our ancient ancestors. But as any passionate student, I became skeptical about some of this common wisdom. For example, that Neanderthals were extraordinarily physically active. And more generally, I began to consider the types of information that are required to translate the static paleontological and archaeological records into behaviorally dynamic terms. Which is what led me to experimentalism. Stony Brook has a long and unique, a very unique history in approaching anthropological questions with experimental methods. And as a graduate student here at Stony Brook, I've been very fortunate to be part of this respected community of experimental anthropologists. And I've been lucky to be involved in a number of experimental projects aimed at better understanding primate functional morphology and evolution, including a study of locomotor kinematics and kinetics in monkeys, uh, muscle activity during lemur locomotion. And I've even been able to maintain an active interest in experimental archaeology. And for those of you not familiar with the term, flint napping is just a fancy way of saying stone tool production. And this is a picture of me being a subject in a study investigating arm motion uh, during flint napping. But much of my uh, research as a graduate student has focused on the central topic of this presentation, and that is the relationship between physical activity and bone structure. And this research has relied heavily on the use of, uh, of mice as a model organism. Currently, mice are the experimental model of choice among most bone biologists uh, for a number of practical reasons, but also because the genes and molecular pathways affecting the skeleton are highly conserved in mice and humans. And importantly, their skeletal response to altered mechanical signals is often observed to be very similar. Now let's go back to this comparison of femoral structure in New Yorkers and Pleistocene humans. Something that might have crossed your minds when looking at this graph is that these groups are separated genetically by a number of generations. And how might this have affected patterns in femoral structure as opposed to, say, physical activity differences? Now, within the biomedical world, there's a pretty solid consensus that a person's bone structure is determined to an important extent by their particular genetic complement. And this has been recognized for many, many years. For example, here's a figure from an old article comparing a mouse femur that developed under normal uh, functional loading to one that was transplanted into the spleen and developed in an environment devoid of mechanical signals. The transplanted bone clearly developed into a recognizable femur despite the absence of loading, which underscores the strong influence of genetics on bone morphology. More recently, in humans, one approach that researchers commonly use to approximate the relative importance of genetics versus environmental factors uh, is to look at twins. Now, it's not important to go into how these twin studies are conducted, but the most important thing is just to realize that twin studies consistently, very consistently, suggest that a large portion of the variance in bone morphology is heritable. For example, in a recent study by Wagner and colleagues, it was estimated that perhaps 90% of the variance in femoral uh, bone quantity uh, is explained by genetic factors. Now, I don't think there are any anthropologists who would say that genetic background has no effect on bone structure, but there are certainly many that believe that relative to physical activity, the influence of genetics and other non-mechanical factors are relatively small. 
For example, consider this quote from a well-known biological anthropologist who happened to be the PhD advisor of my advisor. So in Proyshoff's view, uh, bone shape may be caused only by the stresses acting on the element, which led him to ultimately conclude that the assumption of genetical determination of morphological characters seems to be unnecessary, at least in details of the postcranial skeletons, at least in regard to view, whatever, okay. <laughs> so this is a pretty extreme view. Here's a somewhat less extreme view by Chris Ruff and colleagues from the most widely cited paper from the American Journal of Physical Anthropology in the last decade, which is the flagship journal of biological anthropology. While there are important genetic influences on bone development, variations in loading are equally, if not more important, in determining variations in morphology. Which leads me to the first of four mouse experiments that I'll talk about today. And this experiment began with a really simple question. Anthropologists claim that bone structure primarily reflects physical activity rather than genetic background. Is that true? And for this experiment, I was fortunate to be able to team up with Ted Garland at the University of California, Riverside, who for the past 20 years has been conducting an artificial selection experiment for high voluntary wheel running in mice in order to study the correlated evolution of locomotor activity and various behavioral and physiological traits. So as this picture on the bottom left illustrates, Ted's selection experiment began with a large base population of outbred or genetically diverse mice from which eight closed lines were established. Four of the eight lines are high runner lines, and the other four lines, and those are selected lines, and the other four lines are kept as randomly bred controls. And in each successive generation, in the four high runner lines, the highest running male and female from each generation are chosen as breeders to propagate the next generation. And in the four uh, control lines, re breeders are randomly chosen. And as this figure illustrates, by generation 16 of the selection experiment, selection resulted in a roughly threefold increase in daily running distance by mice in the selected high runner lines as compared to the, with, to the control line mice. And so for my study, in order to address the relative influence of genetics and loading on bone structure, I used mice from generation 21 of the selection experiment. And just to add a little perspective to this, in human terms, 21 generations of uh, reproductive isolation would correspond to about 600 years of genetic separation. And so in my exper experiment, when animals were one month old, males from each of the eight lines were assigned to one of two groups, either sedentary or active. 10 animals from each line, and so 80 animals total. Animals assigned to the active group were housed individually for two months in cages with running wheel access, whereas animals assigned to the sedentary group were housed individually for the same amount of time without wheel access. And throughout the experimental period, wheel running amount was recorded with a computer, uh, computer automated system, and, uh, and by the end of the first month of wheel access, high runners were running on average more than 13 kilometers per day which is a ph phenomenal distance for an animal that weighs 25 grams or so. And the non-selected uh, controls were running about five kilometers per day. And then after the two months of the experiment, the mouse bones came here to Stony Brook where the femora were scanned using micro CT. And for those of you not familiar with micro CT, it's basically just x-ray imaging in 3D using the same methods as hospital CT scanners, uh, except at a much smaller scale and with massively increased resolution. Here's a micro CT image of a femur of one of my mice. And just note the scale bar here, just to give you some sense of how small these bones are. OK, so in my study, I assessed two regions of, of the femur, cortical bone in the mid shaft and cortical and trabecular bone in the distal metaphysis. And for those of you not familiar with skeletal uh, anatomy, trabecular bone is just the spongy material located in the ends of long bones that made, that's made up of uh, a bunch of tiny little struts or trabeculae. A number of bone morphometric parameters were analyzed, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to focus on four in this talk. First, uh, cortical area, which is simply the amount of bone in the shaft. Uh, and this parameter approximates a cross-section's resi resistance to axial compression and tension. Second, polar moment of area, which describes the distribution of bone in a cross-section. For any given amount of bone, the further away the bone is positioned relative to the area centroid of the bone, the greater the polar moment of area. And this parameter approximates average bending strength of the bone shaft. In terms of trabecular or spongy bone, 
Uh, there's trabecular bone volume fraction, which is just the percentage percentage of the space, the marrow cavity that is taken up by trabecular bone. And this is a measure of overall trabecular bone quantity. And fourth, trabecular number, which is simply the frequency of bony struts per unit area. Increasing trabecular uh, number is one way that you can increase overall trabecular bone quantity or the bone volume fraction. And so again, we have these eight lines of mice, four of which are selected high runner lines and four of which are randomly bred controls. And half of the animals from each of the lines are either allowed or uh, denied wheel access for two months, beginning at one month of age. And at the end of this experiment, we tested for differences in a number of femoral structural properties between the two line types. Uh, so high runner versus control, as well as among the four genetically distinct uh, high runner lines and the four genetically distinct control lines. And of course, we compared the sedentary animals versus the active animals. But for now, I'm going to focus on just a few of the results from the high runner lines only. So among the high runner lines, where animals with wheel access were running well over 10 kilometers per day, wheel running had a non-significant and notably negative effect on femoral uh, mid-shaft cortical area. And I should say that the bars in the next few slides represent uh, least squares, means from uh, ANCOVAs that, used, that included body mass as a covariate and p-values uh, come from the same test, of course. However, among the four lines, significant differences in mid-shaft cortical area were found, indicating the influence of 21 generations of genetic separation. And the same pattern was found for mid-shaft polar moment of area. Running had little effect, but significant differences were found among the four genetically distinct lines. In the metaphysis, like in the diaphysis, wheel running had a non-significant and negative effect on cortical area, and significant differences were detected among the four lines. And the same pattern was found for metaphyseal polar moment of area. In terms of trabecular bone, running didn't significantly affect trabecular bone volume fraction, that is, trabecular bone quantity. But in this, uh, for this structural parameter, neither did genetic background, at least not quite significantly so. Running also had little effect on trabecular number, but significant differences were found among the four lines, indicating the effects of genetic background. So in sum, wheel running didn't significantly affect uh, femoral morphology, but 21 generations uh, of genetic separation among the four high runner lines significantly affected nearly all traits. And without going through all the data, it's worth mentioning that the same results uh, were uh, um, um, were yielded by the control line mice alone. Wheel running did, didn't significantly affect femoral morphology, but significant differences, uh, nearly all traits were detected among the four lines. And the same pattern was found when we consider all lines. So uh, no difference due to, uh, to running, but there are significant differences between the high runner mice and the control mice in nearly all traits. And of course, in this case, for, the, for these sorts of comparisons, it's assumed that uh, these differences are due to the selection regimen. So the results of this work with the high runner mice underscores two facts. First, functional loading doesn't always augment skeletal structure, not even large amounts of loading. And two, the genetic background can have a greater effect on bone structure than functional loading. And of course, both of these insights are antithetical to the paradigm within which anthropologists commonly interpret bone structure. So one thing that I found very surprising about the results of this study is that I didn't detect any interaction effects such that the bones of animals from different lines and line types responded differently to wheel running. And I found this somewhat surprising given hints uh, from several human studies that sensitivity to altered mechanical signals varies among individuals. For example, astronauts can lose between 0 and 20 or 25 percent of bone mass per month of space, space flight, which is a, a large degree of variation. Um, now, there are a number of reasons why I didn't detect any interaction effects. For, for one thing, it's difficult to de detect an interaction when the treatment is uh, not significant. But perhaps uh, it, another factor is that interactions were di uh, difficult to detect because not all of the animals uh, received the same amount of wheel running due to the voluntary nature of it. So, um, so this leads me to the second experiment that I'll discuss today, which was designed specifically to address this question of whether or not genetic background can influence bone sensitivity to functional loading. In this study, rather than wheel running, 
uh, I used a controlled treadmill running regimen as an activity stimulus. Large samples of young mice were employed from two outbred stocks, ICR and CD1. These stocks both derived from a small group of mice that was imported to the U.S. from Switzerland in the 1920s. Descendants were subsequently used to establish various breeding colonies around the U.S., including one at Charles River Laboratory in the 1950s. And this breeding colony became known as CD1. And then in 1983, some of these CD1 mice were used by Harlan Labs to establish a, another colony which they called um, ICR. So these uh, two groups of mice have been separated genetically for uh, about 30 years and over 120 generations, which corresponds in human terms to about 3,500 years of genetic separation. And I should note that large-scale genetic studies have shown that genetic differences between these stocks are similar to genetic differences that exist between closely related human populations, for example, Japanese versus Chinese. And so in this experiment, half of the animals from each stock, 40 animals total, were treated with 30 minutes of treadmill running five days per week for one month, beginning at one month of age. And I should note that body mass was not significantly different between the groups uh, at the beginning of the experiment or at the end of the experiment, as this graph illustrates, nor were there differences at any point throughout the experiment, nor were there differences in limb muscle mass at the end of the experiment. So at the end of the experiment, uh, cortical and trabecular bone uh, were assessed at multiple sites, again using micro CT, but this time uh, in both the femur and the tibia. Cortical bone was assessed in the mid shaft of both bones, and trabecular bone was assessed in the distal femur and in the proximal tibia. So, uh, for femoral mid shaft, in the ICR mice, treadmill running led to a significant increase in cortical bone area. However, in the CD1 mice, running actually led to decreased cortical area. And ultimately, this resulted in a significant stock by activity group interaction. And for the next few slides, if interaction effects are not indicated, then that means that they weren't significant. The same pattern was found for uh, femoral polar moment of area. Running led to a significant increase in the ICR mice and a decrease in CD1 mice, which resulted in a significant stock by activity interaction. In terms of trabecular bone, running significantly increased femoral trabecular bone volume fraction in the ICR mice, but not in the CD1 mice. And the same pattern was found for trabecular number. Treadmill running led to a significant increase in the ICR and no, no difference in the CD1 mice. For the tibial midshaft, running caused an increase in cortical area in both the ICR and the CD1 mice, but the, the increase due to running was only significant in the ICR mice. And the same pattern was found for tibial polar moment of area. In terms of trabecular bone volume fraction, running led to significant increase, or running led to a greater increase in the ICR mice than the CD1 mice, but the differences weren't significant in either of the stocks. And the same pattern was found for trabecular number. And to determine whether or not these patterns of morphological variation translated to variation in actual bone strength, I also mechanically tested the bones in three-point bending. And the methods here are pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, a bone is situated in a three-point bending jig, and the mechanical testing machine applies a force to the mid-shaft. And this force causes displacement or deformation of the shaft, which eventually causes it to break. And the magnitude of the force and the corresponding amount of deformation are measured. And this allows, uh, uh, allows us to construct a force displacement curve from which various mechanical properties can be calculated. Um, this portion of the curve that's highlighted in red is called the linear portion, and its slope represents the stiffness or rigidity of the bone. And the apex of the curve represents the maximum force that the bone can withstand uh, before failure. And so uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to focus on these two uh, parameters. And the results were exactly what one might predict from the bone morphology results. In the femur, running led to a significant increase in maximum force in the ICR mice and a decrease in maximum force in the CD1 mice, which resulted in a significant stock by activity interaction. And the same pattern was found for femoral stiffness. In the tibia, running led to increased maximum force in both the ICR and CD1 mice, but the effect was only significant in the ICR mice. And the same pattern was found for tibial stiffness. 
So you might be wondering to what extent uh, variation in home cage activity patterns might have influenced the bone results, which is why in this study I measured home cage activity in all of the animals at multiple points throughout the experimental period using a system equipped with infrared sensor technology that's designed to measure activity while the animals are in their normal cages. And here's a plot of average daily home cage activity among the ICR mice over a 24-hour period. The x-axis is the time of day and the y-axis is the square root of the number of ambulatory counts uh, per two hours. And the first thing that probably pops out at you is that mice are a lot more active when the lights are off than when the lights are on, and that's because they're nocturnal. <laughs> Uh, the second thing that probably uh, is easily recognizable is that the behavioral patterns between the sedentary uh, animals and runners are very similar. In fact, none of these differences are significant. And a similar pattern was found for the CD1 mice. The runners and sedentary controls had very similar home cage activity patterns. Perhaps most importantly is that in both stocks, the number of total ambulatory counts throughout the entire day was not significantly different between the runners and sedentary controls. So the bottom line is that it's very unlikely that the bone results were greatly influenced by stock uh, differences in home cage activity. And so perhaps you might be wondering to what extent limb forces uh, engendered by running and walking uh, were different between the two stocks, which is why, uh, which could also be a confounding factor in this experiment. Um, and for this reason, I acquired a dozen extra animals from each of the stocks uh, to measure their peak vertical uh, limb forces in, uh, engendered by uh, walking and running. Now, the only part of this force plate design that I can take credit for is this really sleek runway. Um, the actual force plate was designed by a guy named Dan Riskin, formerly at Brown, uh, and Dan was uh, generous enough to lend it to me. And so from this video, uh, you can see that I was able to collect limb forces from both the forelimbs and the hind limbs, but since uh, for, the, for right now we're only um, interested in the mechanical environment of the femur and tibia, I'll just uh, provide um, data on the, the femur uh, limb forces, or the hind limb forces. So here's a block, box plot of peak vertical hind limb forces in the two stocks in units of body mass. And uh, you probably don't need a p-value here to realize that these are, are pretty similar. Um, and so it's very unlikely that limb forces were a confounding factor in this experiment either. Okay, so let me tie all of these results together. The stocks had similar limb forces during walking and running. In both stocks, running didn't alter body mass. In both stocks, running didn't alter home cage activity level, but in the ICR mice, running enhanced bone structure and strength, and in the CD1 mice, running did not enhance bone structure and strength. So the take home point from the second experiment is that the responsiveness of bones to functional loading varies across populations. And from an anthropological perspective, this is, an, this is a pretty important observation because if the responsiveness of bone to physical activity might be expected to have varied among past populations, then the magnitude of any functional signal could differ in the bones of individuals from different populations despite identical activity patterns during life. Okay, so now to the third experiment that I'll talk about. And this experiment also examined how genetics and loading interact in the skeleton. But this time, my interest was in the relationship between these factors over evolutionary time. Specifically, I was interested in the possibility that genetic variation underlying bone structure is influenced by the physical activity levels of ancestral populations and might therefore have functional significance in an evolutionary context. My reasoning here was that natural selection favoring, a particular, favoring particular activity levels will inevitably engender an evolutionary response involving multiple changes in anatomy and physiology, as well as underlying genetics. And given the critical role of the skeleton in locomotion, it's conceivable that genes influencing bone structure would be among those especially affected. And this idea hasn't been lost on anthropologists. Uh, for example, here's a quote from a well-known anthropologist, Steve Churchill, who said in an article published in Evolutionary Anthropology, which is produced here at Stony Brook, that heightened skeletal strength may be expected to positively co-occur in populations with an evolutionary history of high activity. And of course, he's refer referring here to our old friends, the Neanderthals. And so in this scenario, thick, strong bones among Neanderthals might be present even at very early ages as an evolutionary response to selection acting on earlier members of a lineage. For example, here's tibial cortical bone area in a Neanderthal infant compared to a geographically diverse sample of modern children. 
the y-axis is bone quantity and the x-axis is age. And so this guy had pretty strong bones for a one-year-old uh, and uh, you know, chances are he wasn't even walking at this age. And so to examine the degree to which uh, bone structure reflects ancestral activity of members of a lineage, excuse me, I use an experimental evolution approach, again involving mice from the selection experiment for high voluntary wheel running. Specifically, I tested for differences in femoral structure in one week old animals from both the high runner and the control lines. And following Churchill, I hypothesized that if bone structure reflects ancestral activity patterns, then high, high runner mice uh, will have stronger bones at one week uh, compared to the controls. And um, the reason why I looked at uh, one week old animals is that at this age, the, any differences between the groups can be assumed uh, to be related to selection rather than direct mechanical stimuli since mice don't begin walking around till shortly after one week. And once again, micro CT was used to assess femoral uh, shaft structure. And as you can see, mouse limb bones look a little bit like Swiss cheese at this age, which required a sort of uh, atypical strategy for quantifying shaft structural properties. And it required the help of expert micro CT technician uh, Svetlana Lublinsky, who was formerly in the uh, Sony Brook BME department. And basically, here's what we did. We uh, started with a gray uh, scale image of the CT cross section then segmented the bone from the background using a filter, then a mask was created by applying a closing operation to the segmented image, and, the, and uh, then contour lines were created around the edges of the cortical mask, and these contour lines were used to define the volume of interest from which the structural properties were calculated. So in this case, structural properties shouldn't be interpreted as true indicators of shaft, shaft strength, but simply as geometric parameters uh, delineating bone shape. And I should mention that the degree of porosity was not significantly different between the uh, selected and non-selected mice. So the results were pretty clear. Uh, among the female mice, selected high runners had significantly higher cortical, cortical bone areas compared to non-selected control mice. And again, these bars are least squares means from ANCOVAs that it, uh, controlled for the effects of body mass. And the same goes for femoral polar moment of area. Selected high runners had enhanced femoral shafts compared to controls. Among the males, again, selected high runner mice had higher cortical bone areas, although not quite significantly so. But they did have significantly higher polar moments of area compared to controls. So as hypothesized, it appears that selection for high levels of physical activity indeed led to an evolutionary enhancement of bone structure. Now what's the adaptive significance of this evolutionary signal? In principle, the activity patterns of earlier members of a generation could be incorporated into the genome of subsequent generations by the process known as genetic assimilation. In this model, phenotypic traits individually acquired through a plastic response to environmental stimuli are incorporated into an organism's developmental repertoire if the environmental stimulus becomes fixed. So in the case of limb bones, if there's a shift in the loading environment that elicits a response in a given generation, for example, increased loading uh, associated with high activity causes individuals to grow strong bones. And this new loading environment persists in subsequent generations, that is, members of the lineage remain highly active, then the loading-induced phenotype may become genetically assimilated. And this scenario is consistent with the adaptationist perspective um, expressed by the Churchill quote. Alternatively, however, the evolutionary signal need not be interpreted as adaptive. For one thing, from an energetic perspective, elevated bone mass might be considered maladaptive for highly active animals because it should increase the metabolic cost of locomotion, which is perhaps why a lot of cursorial animals like cheetahs and greyhounds tend to have light, slender bones and not big, strong, heavy bones. In this light, it's perhaps likely that enhanced bone structure in high runner mice isn't an adaptation, but instead an evolutionary byproduct or a spandrel, as the late Stephen Jay Gould would call it. In other words, enhanced bone structure might be simply a, uh, genetically associated with physical activity through pleiotropic gene action or molecules that regulate both physical activity and bone development. Of course, in this case, uh, then the results of this experiment would caution against using bone structure to infer ancestral activity patterns. In any case, the bottom line is, uh, of this third experiment is that an evolutionary signal conditioned by ancestral activity can, in some cases, be discerned from bone structure. 
but understanding the possible functional and adaptive significance of this observation will require a lot more work. And now for the fourth and final experiment, uh, which focused on a somewhat different issue uh, than the three previous experiments, but an issue that's nevertheless re relevant to anthropological inferences about ancient activity based on skeletal remains. So although many aspects of mechanical loading history could be important contributors to bone strength, most anthropologists uh, who use skeletal remains to infer loading history assume that high impact loading uh, during vigorous exercise has the greatest influence on bone. So when differences in structure are detected among past populations, for example, between Neanderthals and early modern humans, these morphological differences are thought to reflect varying amounts of strenuous, energetically costly physical activity. And there are certainly studies uh, that have documented a positive relationship between the magnitude of bone stress and the magnitude of osteogenic response. For example, here's a plot from the uh, widely cited paper by Clint Rubin of Stony Brook from uh, an external limb loading experiment with turkeys showing a positive relationship between load-induced bone strain and the amount of bone added. But again, a number of other aspects of the skeleton's mechanical environment besides load magnitude could influence bone structure including the diversity of load orientation. Several years ago, a researcher named Lance Lanyon hypothesized that loads originating from irregular or novel directions might be potent stimuli for osteogenesis even if load magnitudes are relatively low, in which case low intensity activities that engender loads from diverse directions might be expected to have a similar effect on bone as vigorous high impact exercise. In some see as support for this idea the observation that athletes engaged in sports in which the hip is loaded in a wide range of directions, for example soccer, have enhanced femoral neck bone mass uh, similar to athletes that engage in high impact sports like volleyball. Um, let me go, sorry. Um, however, direct evidence has been lacking that relatively low impact activities producing loads from diverse directions can augment the skeleton. Okay. So uh, a former postdoc here at Stony Brook named Chris Carlson and I developed a novel experimental design to examine the skeletal effects of emphasizing activities that involve loading from diverse directions. Beginning at one month of age, mice were housed individually for three months in custom-built experimental enclosures uh, that emphasized either nonlinear locomotion, that is diverse orientation loading, or linear locomotion or stereotypic orientation loading and behavioral assessments were performed daily to quantify home cage activity level. After three months, trabecular and cortical bone in the humeral head and distal femoral metaphysis were analyzed with micro CT. And what we found was that the mice that emphasized diverse orientation loading had significantly greater trabecular bone quantity in the proximal humerus compared to animals that emphasized stereotypic orientation loading. In the proximal humerus, animals that experienced more diverse loads also had enhanced cortical bone area. And it's important to note that cage activity levels didn't differ between the groups over the course of the experiment, meaning that differences in bone structure can reasonably be attributed to qualitative differences in their locomotor behavior. Interestingly, however, no significant group differences were detected in the distal femur. Although animals that engaged in increased nonlinear locomotion tended to have higher bone quantity, which is consistent with the pattern uh, detected in the humerus. Now, the different response in the humerus and femur isn't easy to explain, but I suspect it's related to the functional roles played by the forelimbs and hindlimbs when mice change direction during quadrupedal locomotion. As this figure uh, attempts to illustrate, but not very well, uh, when mice turn, most of the torque to rotate the body is uh, provided by the forelimbs, uh, which is fa facilitated by the relatively unrestricted range of motion of the shoulder. Um, the hind limbs, in contrast, uh, are primarily responsible for just accelerating the rotated body in the new direction, which involves motion at the knee that occurs approximately in a single plane. So therefore, it seems reasonable that increased nonlinear locomotion had a greater effect on the structure of the humerus than the femur uh, because the direction of the loads uh, engendered by turning were more diverse in the shoulder and the knee but this would require um, more experiments to verify that. Nevertheless, the results obtained uh, from the humerus provide the first experimental support for Lanyon's old idea that modifying habitual activities to entail loading from more diverse directions, even if they're low impact activities, can augment skeletal structure. 
And from a clinical perspective, this is interesting because it suggests that feasible physical activity regimens might be built upon the principles of load orientation diversity to improve uh, skeletal health in individuals that are unable or unwilling to engage in vigorous high impact exercise. And from an anthropological perspective, uh, this is very interesting because it means that radically different behaviors, low impact and high impact, can have a similar anabolic effect on bone structure, which limits one's ability to make inferences about specific behaviors based on skeletal remains. Okay, so to summarize, here are five take-home points from these four mouse experiments. One, functional loading doesn't always improve skeletal structure and strength. Two, Genetics can have a greater influence on bone structure than mechanical loading. Three, genetics can influence bone's responsiveness to functional loading. Four, bone structure may be influenced not only by individual physical activity patterns, but also by ancestral physical activity. And five, a particular bone structural end state can be achieved by very different functional loading patterns. And so all of this suggests that a large amount of caution is necessary when comparisons like this one are made to glean information about human physical activity in the past. And so finally, I want to end today with a quote uh, that I really like from the memoirs of Sherry Washburn, an anthropologist who played a big role in the shift in biological anthropology from a discipline focused on simple categorization of fossils to one focused on evolutionary questions. So Washburn thought about it like this. The form of the traditional question in comparative anatomy or physical anthropology is describe with words or measurement, compare and draw conclusions. The modified form is choose what is to be compared on the basis of some clearly defined important problem, compare, speculate, then devise experiments to determine the probability of the speculations. The main research effort should be on the experimental, in the experimental analysis. And I'd like to think that the research that I've shared with you today exemplifies this modified view of the scope of biological anthropology. So I sincerely thank you all for being here today and I'm truly flattered by your interest in my research. And of course this research wouldn't have been possible without funding and the help of uh, several people that I have the honor of calling my collaborators on this. So thank you. <laughs>